We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero J, and I feel fine. Okay, my feet are out. Okay, I'm out. Well, it looks funny out there. See my glove out there, Jim. Jimmy Boyle, yeah. get back in. Yeah. Good morning, Gordo. Yes, how are you? How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? By cooperating together in these new realms of infinity. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 64 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. I recommend listening to episode 63 before you listen to this episode. And now, Gemini 5 with Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad, 8 Days or Bust, Part 2. On August 21, 1965, Pete Conrad and his Gemini 5 command pilot, Gordo Cooper, blasted off on a mission which they had lightly dubbed Eight Days or Bust. Privately, they would come to refer to it somewhat disparagingly as Eight Days in a Garbage Can. When we left off episode 63, the crew of Gemini 5 and Mission Control were struggling with a low pressure in the fuel cell. This was Flight Director Chris Kraft's first major problem at the new Mission Control Center in Houston. He knew the spacecraft had enough battery power for re-entry even if the fuel cell failed completely, but he needed to know if there would be enough time to reach a good re-entry zone such as the Mid-Pacific near Hawaii on the 6th orbit. While Kraft waited for an answer, the fuel cell pressure dropped to 120 PSI. During this time, the McDonnell Company quickly set up a test in St. Louis to find out the lowest working pressure for a fuel cell. But by this time, most of Gemini 5's onboard equipment such as the radar, radio, computer, and even some of the environmental controls had been shut down. And as Gemini 5 swept over the Atlantic on its third orbit, there was much speculation that a re-entry would have to be attempted before the end of the sixth orbit, because Gemini 5's subsequent flight plan would take it away from the Pacific recovery area. During the fourth orbit, Flight Director Kraft was assured that the batteries were good for 13 hours. Also, Mission Control learned that the low-pressure tests in St. Louis were going well. Then, as the astronauts passed within range of the Tenerife tracking station in Malagasy Republic off the east coast of Africa, Cooper reported that pressures were holding at about 120, which suggested the rate of decrease was slowing. But, as he spoke, the oxygen pressures dropped still lower to just 94.3 psi, and fears were high that if the pressure declined much further, Gemini 5 would need its backup batteries to support another one and a half orbits and provide power for re-entry and splashdown. The astronauts were asked to switch off one of the fuel cells to help the system, and as they entered their sixth orbit, the pressure leveled out at 71.1 PSI. Here's a clip on the fuel cells. Gemini 5, this is Houston. We'd like to have you check your fuel cell, O2, H2, heater, circuit breaker, please. A main purpose of this flight is to test the highly sophisticated fuel cells, a device that replaces conventional batteries and generates electrical power by mixing oxygen and hydrogen at very low temperatures, also providing good drinking water as a byproduct. But after only a few hours, on the sixth orbit, oxygen pressure starts falling slowly in one of the two fuel cells. This threatens to reduce electrical power to the danger point. Arrangements are made for an emergency recovery. Gemini 5, Houston again. Uh, Be advised that we've launched the aircraft into the 4 recovery area around Hawaii. Uh, We hope we don't have to use them, but it'll be a good exercise. And if we do need them, they'll be there for you. 
The voice of Capcom, Jim McDivitt, asked Cooper for his opinion on going through another day under these conditions. Cooper replied, we might as well try it. But Kraft remained undecided. After weighing all available options, including the otherwise satisfactory performance of the cabin pressure, oxygen flow, and suit temperatures, together with the prestige to be lost if the mission had to be aborted, he and his control team emerged satisfied that oxygen pressure had stabilized at 71.1 psi. If there were no more drops, Gemini 5 would be fine to remain in orbit for a drifting flight, staying aloft just long enough to reach the primary recovery zone in the Atlantic sometime after its 18th orbit. Admittedly, with barely 11 amps of power, only a few of the mission's 17 experiments could be performed, but Kraft felt they were in reasonably good shape, and there was a chance the problem might straighten itself out. With these facts in hand, Kraft decided Cooper and Conrad could fly for at least one day. Here's a clip on the decision to continue the mission. Should Chris Kraft follow the mission rules and terminate the flight at only the sixth of the planned 121 orbits? He briefs Conrad on the situation. Looks like we got a situation here that's stabilized, Pete. Uh, we've been there was a case that if we'd gone exactly by the written word, we'd have ended the flight. Whereas we were able to milk the thing. Now we we had to maintain ourselves in a position of can we safely carry on? And we said, now look, we got enough battery power to last us 13 to 15 hours, even if even if the fuel cells completely quit. And we've got a recovery situation that allows us to recover every orbit if we get into a problem. So let's give it a whirl. And let's press on as long as we can. Okay, what do you think? As Pete remembers, okay, we'll look at this thing for another there's no man that I've ever run let's into who down. isn't more behind like you were the crew, you up over here and, and I'll do everything in his power to keep him uh, as long as it's safe. Power, and as long as we were willing to go, again. by making that kind of a decision, that would have to the eight days. Back in Houston, it was time for second shift. Flight director Gene Krantz and his crew came on duty. While Krantz and his problem solvers wrestled with the oxygen heater, Edwin Buzz Aldrin worked with a mission planning and analysis division team to design maneuvers for some sort of practice rendezvous now that the pod was out of the picture, just in case the electrical system should be salvaged. Krantz's team thought it would be safe to go ahead and operate the fuel cells, when Flight Director Hodge's third shift crew arrived, the three flight directors agreed to tell Cooper to turn the electricity back on. They were relieved when the pressure remained stable as the fuel cells were brought back online. Hodge's flight planners gave the crew some experiments and systems checks to perform, which required more and more power. Back in space, Conrad and Cooper, believing they might have to land early, had begun to stow things for re-entry. Now that they were back in business, the cabin was soon full of loose gear again. Then it was time for some rest. It had been a long, cliff-hanging first day for Cooper and Conrad. The astronauts had no better luck sleeping than McDivitt and White did on Gemini 4. At first they tried sleeping alternatively, but the sleeper was soon disturbed by the ground calling. As long as one of them was awake, there would be radio transmissions, and they decided this sleep schedule would not work. So they tried, not altogether successfully, to sleep, eat, and work together. While Gemini 5 continued in low power and fuel conservation mode, also known as drift mode, the cabin got cold. The crew turned the airflow on low, but continued to shiver. This was very different from Mercury flights where the capsule had tended to overheat. The suit coolant system seemed too cold, so they took the hoses off and stopped the flow inside their suits. As the spacecraft tumbled through space, the sight of the stars spinning around outside the window bothered the astronauts until Cooper covered the windows and blocked out the view. 
On the third day, which Cooper and Conrad considered the high point of the flight, the astronauts worked steadily on experiments and did a series of maneuvers for phantom rendezvous. At Mission Control, Buzz Aldrin had been working out an alternative rendezvous test. His plan was to have the crew rendezvous with a point in space. The flight controllers set up their calculations on the assumptions that they were tracking an Agena in a different orbit from Gemini 5. The controllers would then pass the information to the crew just as though the target vehicle really existed. Using both ground and spacecraft computations, Cooper would then maneuver Gemini 5 to a rendezvous with this moving point in space, giving him a chance to check out the complete maneuvering system. Such precise moves were new to manned spaceflight, but Cooper came through like a champion, bringing his spacecraft to the exact position Kraft had asked for. Doubts about being able to accomplish rendezvous faded, and the mission planners were confident and ready for Gemini 6. After this success, the crew powered down the electrical system and resigned themselves to drifting in space, performing experiments when possible. In the evening, Cooper asked for and got some uninterrupted sleep. Cooper slept seven hours and Conrad five, so their workday began at a more normal time. It was the fourth day, and it would be their last busy shift. First they saw a rocket sled test as they flew over Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. On the next orbit over Vandenberg, they sighted the contrail of a chase plane, just before they glimpsed the ignition of a Minuteman missile. In the Atlantic, they observed their prime recovery carrier, Lake Champlain, with a destroyer astern. But, down below emission control, a new problem was causing fresh worries. The fuel cell was producing wastewater not suitable for drinking as it was too acidic that was stored in a tank on board. This was the same tank used for drinking water with the potable and non-potable water separated by a bladder wall. The problem was that the fuel cell was producing 20% more discharge than expected. Since there was no way to dump the fuel cell's product water overboard, the crew decided to drink the potable water so there would be more room for the fuel cell discharge. Even though the fuel cells were producing 20% more fluid than had been expected, it was calculated that there would still be enough room left for an eight-day mission. On the fifth day, the glitches continued. The orbital attitude and maneuvering systems, ohms, grew sluggish and one thruster quit. None of the attempts to resolve the thruster problem were successful. This meant the cancellation of all experiments requiring fuel. This required the pilot, Cooper, to rely more heavily on the larger engines and expend considerably more propellant than anticipated. It was at around this time that Gemini 5 broke Valery Baikowski's five-day endurance record, and Mission Control asked Cooper if he wanted to execute a couple of rolls and a loop to celebrate, but Cooper declined, saying he could not spare the fuel. Next, a personal record was achieved. When the mission reached 119 hours and 6 minutes, Gordo Cooper, with his additional 34 hours from his Mercury flight under his belt, became the world's record holder for the most time spent in space. Here's the clip. Good morning, Gordo. Yes, how are you? How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? At various times during the mission, the astronauts performed experiments. Seventeen experiments were planned for Gemini 5. One was canceled because it involved photography of the rendezvous pod. Experiment D1 involved the crew photographing celestial objects, and D6 was a ground photography experiment. For experiment S1, 
Gordon Cooper took photographs of the zodiacal light, which is a faint, roughly triangular-shaped glow of light extending away from the sun. And he took photographs of the Gegenschein, which is a faint spot of light in the sky diametrically opposite the sun. Experiment S7, the cloud top spectrometer, revealed that heights of clouds could be determined from orbit. Defense Department experiments D4 and D7, the celestial radiometry and space object photography, were combined to make irradiance measurements on celestial and terrestrial backgrounds and on rocket plumes. The final defense experiments, S8 and E13, which was visual acuity and astronaut visibility, combined use of an in-flight vision tester and the observation of rectangular marks in fields near Laredo, Texas and Carnarvon, Australia. Weather and operational problems made ground observation difficult. The astronauts were never able to see the Carnarvon field and the Laredo pattern was partially read in the 48th revolution. The tester showed that the crew's vision did not change during the eight-day flight. The Defense Department experiments provided good propaganda for the Soviet media. Cooper and Conrad's flight path carried them over North Vietnam 16 times, as well as 40 times over China and 11 times over Cuba, prompting the Soviet Defense Ministry's Red Star newspaper to claim that they were undertaking a reconnaissance mission. The situation was not helped by President Johnson's decision while the crew was in orbit to fund a major $1.5 billion U.S. Air Force space station known as the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. Of course, medical experiments were conducted as well. Here's a clip. Okay, uh, Dr. Perry, I'd like to talk to you here for a couple of minutes. Oh, Gordo and Pete, you've had uh, 100 hours. 11 they assist in extensive space-to-earth medical examinations of themselves to test the physical effects of long-duration flight. Gemini 5 carried the same medical experiments as Gemini 4, plus medical experiment M1, cardiovascular conditioning, and M9, human otholith function, to see if the ability to perceive the horizontal deteriorated during flight which it did not. For experiment M1, Conrad wore inflatable leg cuffs. When activated, the cuffs pressurized automatically for two minutes out of six minutes. They could be run continuously throughout the flight or be turned off. Conrad had some problems with the equipment, but he felt the cuffs might be useful for extremely long missions. His pulse rate returned to normal faster than Cooper's after the flight, and he did lose 4% less plasma volume. During the flight, lead physician Dr. Chuck Berry's main concerns were fatigue, and his advice was that they get as much sleep as possible, to which Conrad replied, quote, I try to, but you guys keep giving us something to do, end quote. All in all, they managed between five and seven hours of sleep at a time, and expressed little dissatisfaction with Jiminy Five's onboard meals, consisting of bite-sized, freeze-dried chunks of spaghetti and meatballs, chicken sandwiches, and peanut cubes rehydrated with a water pistol. As the mission drug on, the crew was getting a little bored during their downtime. Gordon Cooper spent some of his time composing a song. Here's the clip. Gordo composed this yesterday after our system uh, pooped out on us. And you can sing it to, uh, we were sailing along, it goes like this. We were drifting along by the CSQ when the radio suddenly said, here's word for you. Your controls are dead, but you're not through. So here we are for three days more with the end quite far. Hey, Pete. Pete, you're doing great till the last line. <laughs> Re recompose that, will you? We'll work on it. We have a few more that are better. But... Year 
Years later, Conrad would recall that the eight-day marathon was the longest thing he ever had to do in his life. He and Cooper had spent the better part of six months training together, so they didn't have any new stories to swap with each other. There just wasn't a whole lot of conversation going on up there. Nancy Conrad would recall her late husband describing how the confined cabin caused his knees to bother him. Conrad's knee sockets felt as if they had gone dry, and that he would have gone crazy if asked to stay aloft much longer. Conrad also found it hard to sleep, hard to get comfortable, and the failures meant he and Cooper spent long periods simply floating with nothing to do. After the flight, he told fellow astronaut Tom Stafford that he wished he had taken a book. Nancy Conrad described Cooper's mood as irritated at losing so much of his mission. He was far from thrilled that the two main tasks for Gemini 5, rendezvous and long-duration flight, were becoming little more than learning curve opportunities, and suggested throwing an on-board telescope in the Cape Kennedy dumpster when it twice refused to work. With the spacecraft on minimum power and the astronauts still being expected to keep up a full schedule, Cooper told Mission Controls, quote, You guys ought to take a second look at that. End quote. As for physical activity, Cooper said his only exercise was chewing gum and wiping his face with a cleansing towel. On the ground, Deke Slayton was concerned that such an attitude would not help the command pilot's reputation with NASA's top brass. Indeed, Gemini 5 would be Cooper's final space flight, and although he would later complain bitterly about losing the chance to command an Apollo mission, some within the astronaut corps would feel that Cooper's performance and strap-it-on-and-go outlook had harmed his career. Tom Stafford wrote in his autobiography, Gordo had a fairly casual attitude toward training operations on the assumption that he could show up, kick the tires, and go, the way he did with aircraft and fast cars. During the final days of the mission, worries about the fuel cells continued to plague Gemini 5. With the cells producing 20% more water than expected, there was now a concern the water excess might back up into the cells and knock them out entirely. In order to create as little additional water as possible, the astronauts powered down the capsule from 44 to just 15 amps. And on August 26, Chris Kraft even considered bringing them home a day early on their 107th orbit. However, by the following day, the water problem had abated, largely due to the crew drinking more than their usual quota. On the seventh day in orbit, the astronauts had a little problem with their food. Here's the clip. On the seventh day, another kind of crisis occurs as Gordo and Pete prepare a lunch of shrimp contained in a squeeze bag. And that shrimp was the thickest of all the stuff that you mixed up and tried to squeeze out it too. And I was really squeezing down on that bag and it blew out on Gordo's side and there was shrimp was floating all over everywhere in it. Now it's really little shrimp, you know, these little tiny... Little pieces, yeah, shrimp. And uh, they'd stick on the instruments and uh, get them on the suit and, uh, you know, it just took a long time snatching them out of the air. (laughs) 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 Cleaning it up and uh, I was very mad that we got any dirt on our flight suits or any junk in the spacecraft because we've been that's all we had to do for seven days anyhow was store garbage <laughs> <laughs> on the last day of the mission the astronauts had an opportunity to talk to an aquanaut mercury aurora 7 veteran scott carpenter who was on detached duty to the navy Carpenter, who had broken his arm in a motorcycle accident a year before and had been medically grounded by NASA, was partway through a 45-day expedition in command of Sea Lab 2, an underwater laboratory on the ocean floor just off the coast of La Jolla, California. The Sea Lab effort, conceived jointly by the Navy and the University of California's Scripps Institution of Oceanography, sought to discover the 
capacity of men to live and work effectively at depth. As the time neared to bring Gemini 5 back to Earth, another problem cropped up. Hurricane Betsy moved relentlessly toward the planned landing area. The landing area sea state constraints for Gemini were considerably relaxed from those of Mercury. For Mercury, the limits were winds no more than 30 kilometers per hour, waves no more than one and a half meters. But for Gemini, winds could be up to 47 kilometers and waves up to two and a half meters. Weather for Mercury in all the recovery areas, primary, secondary, or contingency had to be good, but there were no such restraints given against Gemini. But it certainly could not be expected to touch down in a hurricane area. The Weather Bureau recommended that Gemini 5 be brought down early to avoid landing too near the storm. Gene Krantz agreed in plenty of time for the Lake Champlain to reach the new recovery zone. Because of the erratic and sometimes inoperable ohms, Kraft allowed the crew to use one of the two rings of the re-entry control system to position the spacecraft properly more than one revolution before coming back to Earth. During the 120th pass, Cooper told McDivitt, Capcom in Houston, that Gemini 5 was ready for retro fire. In the darkness near Hawaii on the morning of August 29th at 190 hours, 27 minutes, 43 seconds, the first retro rocket went off, followed by the second and the third. After what seemed like an eternity, the fourth fired. Cooper peeked out the window and felt as if he were sitting in the middle of fire with the control system thruster spewing flame in front and the retro rockets firing behind, Cooper discovered that a nighttime reentry had to rely strictly on instruments. There was absolutely no way of seeing the horizon or a landmark. He and Conrad stayed on instruments until they passed over the Mississippi in the morning light. Cooper held the spacecraft at full lift until it reached the 120,000 meter altitude and then tilted it to a planned bank angle of 53 degrees. The re-entry gauge, CON, indicated that they were high, meaning that they might overshoot the landing point. Cooper adjusted the angle to 90 degrees left to create more drag and reduce the landing error. The G loads quickly shot from 2.5 to 7.5. At 20,000 meters, Cooper punched the drogue chute button. Gemini 5, unlike Gemini 1, did not oscillate. It was completely stable on the drogue. Cooper then cut in the second control ring thrusters to discard the fuel as the spacecraft came straight down. He and Conrad watched the main parachute as it unfurled and felt the expected jolt at the two-point suspension. In contrast to McDivitt and White's landing, impact was very, very soft. Gemini 5 landed 190 hours, 55 minutes, 14 seconds after launch, 130 kilometers short of the planned landing point. The computer had worked correctly. The error had been human. Earth's rotation is 360.98 degrees per day. A computer programmer had left off the two decimal place numbers, the .98, and fed the computer just the 360 degrees. Cooper's efforts to compensate for what he recognized as an erroneous reading had brought them down closer to the ship than they would have otherwise have been. Planning and Analysis Officer Howard Tyndall said, Hey, it's only our second try at controlling reentry. We'll yet prove it can be done. The short landing caused no problems for the U.S. Navy recovery forces. A helicopter soon arrived over the spacecraft and three swimmers dropped into the water. Cooper and Conrad were very comfortable with a calm sea. Cooper wanted to stay with the spacecraft on this pleasant summer morning about 8.30 Cape time, until he learned that the carrier was still 120 kilometers away. Then he and Conrad rode the helicopter to the Lake Champlain. A Navy Admiral welcomed them aboard ship. 
When asked what they had been thinking about when it looked as though the fuel cell heater problem might cause the mission to end early, Conrad pointed out a picture he had drawn of a covered wagon halfway over a cliff. While on the ship, the astronauts received a call from the president. Salute you both for the very calm and cool courage that you have shown throughout uh, these last eight days. In the face of disappointments and discouragements, you've conducted yourselves nobly. God bless you both. We're glad you're back. We shall be everlastingly proud of you, and we are so thankful for all the blessings that are ours. Well, Gordon, I wish you could be out here with us this morning. Gordon, do you read me? Are you just reluctant, or did you not hear me? Although the crew's worries were over, Dr. Berry's were not. His post-flight concern was the trend in plasma volume and calcium losses, which was increasing on these longer missions. He was aware that the crew had been forced to drift through space the last three days with little to do, but they should have exercised more. Chimney 5 had lasted 7 days, 22 hours, and 55 minutes, and 14 seconds from its pad 19 launch, to hitting the waves of the western Atlantic, and the crew was safely aboard the Lake Champlain by 9.30 a.m. Despite the difficulties, most of Cooper and Conrad's objectives had been successfully met. Yet more success came when Dr. Berry realized that despite the days of inactivity with little exercise aboard the capsule, the astronauts were physiologically back to normal within days, clearing the way for Frank Borman and Jim Lovell to attempt a 14-day endurance run on Gemini 7. A safe landing and a healthy crew after an eight-day space voyage increased NASA's confidence in achieving its lunar landing goal during the 1960s. In a span of only three months in 1965, and after just two long-duration flights, medical fears of weightlessness began to subside. Hugh Dryden reflected this optimism in his report for the President, and I'm reading from the report. The primary objective of the Gemini 5 mission to demonstrate man's ability to function in the space environment for eight days and to qualify the spacecraft system under these conditions was met. This milestone duplicated the period required for the manned lunar exploration mission. Gemini 5 also demonstrated the capability of man to withstand prolonged periods of weightlessness. The adaptability of the human body was indicated by the performance of the astronauts. For example, their heartbeat rates gradually dropped to a level significantly lower than their pre-flight normal rates, but by the fourth day adapted to weightlessness conditions and leveled off. Upon return to Earth, the heartbeat rates were slightly higher than normal, as expected, but returned to a normal rate during the second day. This has assured us of man's capability to travel to the moon and return. End excerpt. Post-flight activities for Cooper and Conrad included a six-nation goodwill tour assigned to them by President Johnson. During the trip, they attended the International Astronautical Federation Congress in Athens, where they talked with the crew of Voskhod 2, Russian cosmonauts Alexei Leonov and Pavel Belyaev. Despite the fuel cell problems, Gemini 5 had many successes. In fact, by the time Cooper and Conrad splashed down, they exceeded the Soviets on several fronts. Nine manned missions to the Soviets' eight, a total of 642 U.S. man-hours in space to 507 of the Soviets, and some 120 U.S. orbits on a single mission to 81 Soviet orbits. The U.S. surpassed Baikovsky's Vostok 5 record at last. And finally, after eight years in the shadows of Sputnik, Gagarin, Tereshkova, Voskhod 1, and Leonov, the United States was pulling ahead into the fast lane of the space race.
Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.